Let us talk therefore about um, bureaucratic systems, administrative system rather, uh, making the distinction between administration, uh, civil service and bureaucracy as we uh, discussed last, uh, uh, in the last lecture. So just go, let us just go briefly to, over uh, these case studies that we have already uh, talked about, the US, the UK, France and Germany, to see how bureaucracies function there. So in the US, um, and you by now all know well, how, what an administrative system is, that it is a machinery, uh, the machinery basically of the government that uh, runs the country, that exercises that power of the state to, to uh, impose its will over the territory and the membership. So in the US, uh, of course, because of um, the specificities of the US as a state and as a political system, you'll have several things. One um, is that it's a federal state, right? So therefore the, administ the administration itself, right? Because you have different levels of government, it means that you have different levels of administration, right? Because government doesn't exist without the administration. Government doesn't exist without the machinery to implement its policies. So the U.S. will have uh, bureaucracy uh, administration at the national uh, level and then at the regional level, right? So the level of the federal government and at the regional level of the state. State in the way in which in the U.S. we use the word state, right? It doesn't really mean state according to the definition. So <clears throat> that's one thing. The other thing is that um, Another specificity of the U.S. as a political system this time, not as a state, is that it is a, what, a presidential political system. And one of the characteristics of a presidential political system is that um, it, is, uh, it has a separation of powers, which means that all the powers, that uh, all the executive power is entrusted into one institution only. Uh, the legislative power is entrusted into one set of institutions distinct from the executive, and so on. So this separation of power is characteristic uh, to the... Uh, U.S., but it's, it is not characteristic to uh, other systems like the parliamentary system and semi-presidential and so on. Um, therefore, let us um, look at a few uh, aspects of the organization of the administration of the, of the executive at the federal level, right? Uh, well, first of all, what we need to know is that administration in the U.S. is, is large. It's, it's, um, um, it, it has grown in the 20th century, just like in any... Um, other advanced uh, democracy, uh, and it is organized into several things. We, at the level of the executive, right, we talk about cabinet. Yes, in the U.S. there is a cabinet. The cabinet is part of the um, executive, and we talked about the fact that it is less important uh, than in other uh, states. So you have cabinet departments, but you also have independent. So you have cabinet departments in the U.S. Right, these departments over which reigns basically the president, the head of the executive. Then you also have independent agencies. For example, the, the CIA right, or the NASA. These are agencies that belong to the uh, 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 whole administrative system, that uh, belong to the executive in a way, but they're independent. They have their own charter, their own rules of functioning and so on. Uh, then you have regulatory agencies. Which makes make important rules for remember that one of the powers of the one of the functions of the administration is to make rules, right? And um, these basically make rules that guide your life. And for example, the Environmental Protection Agency (EPA), right? Uh, it's a agency with <coughs> very powerful rulemaking powers. And then you also have government corporations. They make profit and they, they sell goods, right? Amtrak is one example. The post service, USPS, is another example. So you just see uh, this this um, this way that all these different types and then there's let's add another one, presidential commissions, which are just ad hoc uh, established within the executive. For example, the 9/11 commission, right? It's a or there was another commission for the debt uh, ceiling and so on. So there are commissions that the president can, because the executive power is entrusted into the president, he can just establish. But what you notice here is that, is how these, there are different types, right, but the functions are the same. The functions of the administration of the bureaucracy are the same, and we discussed them uh, last time. Another uh, interesting thing about the U.S., well, <clears throat> it's a highly specialized, trained, well-trained, uh, civil service, those people who are employed by the government. There is a very clear uh, path 
uh, professional path to the civil service, uh, the ranks GS12, GS13, so you go through the ranks according to your seniority, is how, you, how long have you been in the system and performing your duties well and there's kind of a pre-set path of advancement and then higher salary and, and so on. Another thing is, which is typical for bureaucracies, because you see <coughs> there's this rational quality to it, uh, predictability, right? Um, and also because bureaucracies are, in many places around the world, uh, um, vocations or lifelong professions, right? You enter, it's our lifelong careers. So you enter into the, uh, let's say, the um, uh, diplomatic corps in the US, right? In the foreign, uh, foreign service, right? And that's, that's your career. You kind of, you will continue to go uh, there. You can switch and move, but this is a, you know, if you want to go ahead, you, want to, you have to stay in the, on the track. Another thing is that uh, civil servants in the US are expected to be apolitical, uh, to, to perform, execute uh, their jobs, but at the highest ranks, many of the nominations, many of the appointments are political. And the famous uh, negative case was the former head of the FEMA, of the Federal Emer Emergency Ma Management Agency, one of these agencies, right? Now part of the Homeland Security, actually, um, department, mega department. Uh, so, the famous case with the hur Hurricane Katrina, uh, what was his name, Michael Brown, right? Who was appointed for political considerations. So, at the top, you have appointments for political considerations. He was, what, a horse raiser, uh, you know, show horses, and, and he was appointed to, to lead the emergency management agency. And in fact, so, the, the machinery itself is apolitical. At the top, you might have political appointments. Now, that's very briefly about the, about the U.S. and only about the federal uh, level of the, of the bureaucracy. <clears throat> In the U.K., um, it's a different system, right? It's a parliamentary system. And again, have in mind uh, our chart with how, which institutions constitute the uh, British political system. Now, the, the civil service, I don't know if you remember, I mentioned it briefly last time, they, uh, the, the shorthand, short name for, for the civil service, sorry, problems with the whiteboard, the short name for the civil service is Whitehall, just like the shorthand name uh, for the uh, parliament is Westminster. Uh, because that's the name of the building where they're located. So Whitehall is basically the name, short, short name for, for the uh, civil service in, in the UK. Civil service in the UK is a very strange, well not strange, but very peculiar beast. Uh, first of all, it is very important that it is apolitical. Basically, you enter civil service and that's it. Of course, you can quit it, but you can never enter politics. So there's a clear separation between civil service and po politics. So here you see the difference between the machinery that runs the state and the politicians that come in and go out. Just like the difference between the head of state, which represents the ongoing reality of the state in the UK, the monarch, right? And the politicians who come and go, right? The head of the executive, who is the prime minister. So the wife of the civil service is, is apolitical. And they're the specialists who, 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 who spend their lives running the country. And literally what this means is that, you know, there's the cabinet, right? And remember that who are the members of the cabinet in the UK? They're top members of the majority party, right? Because the PM is the head of the majority party, and obviously whichever party has the majority then gets to, to send its own people to populate the government, right? But these are politicians. These are not specialists. So in the US, the president can appoint certain heads of departments who are specialists because he is a, they serve at his leisure. However, in the, in the UK, these people, most of these people, and traditionally they have been um, amateurs in, 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 with regards to the area that they actually uh, <clears throat> are supposed to lead. So, so what happens? How do they run then the government, the country? Well, these people, right, let's say it's a political guy, and there's a phenomenal uh, TV series, a, sort of a sitcom, but it's not a stupid thing, it's actually a very intelligently designed political uh, TV series um, called Yes Minister, and there is an upgrade to that, Yes Prime Minister, so Yes Minister, you can find it online, um, which deals with exactly this, what I'm going to describe. 
So you appoint uh, the prime minister who is the leader of the party, appoints one of the other leaders in the party to one of the ministries. And obviously the most important ministries go to the higher ranking people in the party. You see how it goes. So because it, the executive is just the expression of the legislative power. So this minister of, let's say, public affairs or administration, as the person in the series is, Jim Hacker, um, so what does he know about this field? Nothing. And so how does he run it? Well, he comes in and is appointed at the top of a structure, of a machinery that is continuously there. So here's the country, and here's the entire structure of the, let's say, Minister of, let's say, the Ministry of Public Affairs, uh, Public uh, Development, Public Affairs, whatever. It's actually the Minister of, for Administration in the series. So anyway, Public Affairs, and let's, let's assume that means building infrastructure and so on. Well, the people who run that in the country, they're, they're there for life. They're lifers in that sense, right? They are specialist civil servants who climb through the ranks just like, you know, according to seniority and so on, and specializing on their jobs and so on. So when the new guy is appointed, or woman, is appointed to this position of head of cabinet, the important part is that this connection between the machinery that exists and the new political guy is made. Think of this as, as, an, as, a, as a car, and here's the driver. The car works which, with whichever driver. So of course, the, a bad driver can lead it into an accident, right? But the point is that the car itself works. And that's kind of the, the connection. This is why they, it's very important that they're apolitical, the, the civil servants, because they're like a neutral machine. Of course, no human being is completely neutral, but that's their, the, the, it's this distinction between the civil service, which is, which is apolitical space specialists of running the country, versus the political uh, appointees who come and go, and so on and can be reshuffled here and so on. This is why it works. And if you watch that series, you'll see how amusing this can get. Um, so that's very briefly about the civil service in, in Britain. There are many other things to say, of course, but this is just, you know, just giving you examples how, how it works, or how it can work in different places. Um, so for example, France, right? In France, what do we know about France? Again, think of state and political system. What do you know about the state? It's unitary and what? Centralized, which means that all the power is in the center, which is what? Paris, right? Well, this centralized is just a word, because in order to centralize power, you, that doesn't mean anything. Like, I decide to, I have to centralized power. That doesn't mean anything. What it means is that you um, accumulate the, um, that all the institutions are run from the center. That's, the, well, that's what it means. It means that, the executive, right? Right? That all the policies will be made here at the center, which in, in the case of France means that most civil servants will also work here at the center. Paris is the hub. You know, here's, here's France. Paris is the hub of running the country. And then you have regional hubs. So centralization means that Decision making is concentrated here, which means a whole apparatus of, of uh, administration concentrated in Paris and then concentrated in these individual places. You see how different this is from the US, where you have a layer of federal administration separate from state administration. Why? Because the two governments, because there are two different governments, federal and state, one in federal and regional, national and regional, right? They, having two different governments, means that they, you have different administrations because the policies that they have power over are different, right? I mentioned that in the US, right? You, your life, this part is governed from the center and this part is governed from the state, from the region, right? National, region. But govern means what? That there is a structure of civil servants who run your life here, and there is a structure of civil servants who run your life, this aspect of your life. And this is either the federal aspect of your life and this is the local aspect of your life. And of course you're the same person, but different aspects of your life fall under different policies. But policies mean that there is a system of institution that implements it. Remember, policy is idea to build, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to law, to uh, reality, right? And that space, that direction, that connection between law and reality is policy implementation. 
So you need a structure. So the state, the regional government will have a structure of uh, bureaucracy, the national government will have a structure of bureaucracy. Right? This is why there are two different levels. Not here. Here everything comes from the center. That's what it means centralized. So all the structures of bureaucracy leads to Paris, just like just like all the train lines lead to Paris, amusingly enough. Because this is how they're co constructed. They're not constructed around or and so on. There are some connections, but it's hard actually. To get from here to here, you have to go up and here and here. This is how you go with the train. Okay. But it's similar with you know, centralization. It, visually, it's the same uh, in, in administration, similar in administration and transportation. So, so that's France. So that's that's what makes it special. Another thing that makes it distinct, and I, we don't we're not going to spend time on, on this, is that um, uh, most of the civil servants come from a, a very small number of schools, which are called grandes école. And actually, these are sort of the Ivy League, but an Ivy League that is mostly based on engineering, mostly based on administration and politics, right? This is what you study here. And interestingly enough, the entire elite of France kind of goes to these schools. Uh, and that means elite in business, elite in politics, elite in the civil service, grants and call, which kind of makes a, for a very um, similar culture. And the people who go to these schools obviously think in a similar way. But what's more in interesting and important in France than this, this is just like an interesting fact, and you can read more on this because there are other details here, is that um, the administration is not apolitical. Or, or a career in civil service, the civil service itself is not apolitical. To the contrary, you, many of, of the prime ministers of France have come from the civil service. Uh, and you can jump from one branch to the other. You can be in politics, you can go into the civil service and running the country, because state and politics are more closely intertwined, unlike in the UK, you see, uh, just across the channel. So not, so not apolitical. That means not apolitical. Which means that you can be in the civil service, but you can also be, you know, in politics and you can jump from one aspect to the other. Uh, and as I said, uh, many also because in the schooling, you know, they, it's the same kind of uh, channel through which you get through pol to politics, to top political positions, to top positions in the state, to top positions in politics, to top positions in the administration. And the administration, the bureaucracy is very widespread, powerful because the state is powerful. When I say that the state in France is powerful, it means that it has a very broad, powerful, all encompassing bureaucracy. And finally, just again briefly, uh, Germany. And when you, how does the, how would the bureaucracy look in Germany? Well, obviously, ask yourself what is what can you tell me about Germany? Briefly, is about the state and the political system. One, it is federal. Two, uh, it is a parliamentary system. So, what does it mean for an, for a, for a, for, a, for an administration, for an administrative system? Well, obviously, federal will mean what that. There are two levels of government, one national and one regional, right? But because when you say there are two levels of government, it means what? That there are two levels of administration, and different right? levels of administration. But how does it work? In the US, there's a separation, a distinction between the federal and the uh, uh, regional, the national and the regional, meaning that there's different governments with different areas of policy. not in, so there's a separation, right? Separation of power, so to speak, although that applies to something else. Not in Germany. In Germany, it's a cooperative federalism, which means that policy is made in both places because there are different areas of life that they are run, but basically the broad directions of policy are made here, at the center, but the implementation happens here. So it's not separate. It's basically the broad lines and the details. This is why, if you remember, there is an upper house called Bundesrat. And this is what, remember, these are the representatives of the governments of each of these regions. And what do they do? 
they shape national laws so that they can be implemented well in the regions. So think of policy in Germany as being made in the center with huge, huge continuous feedback from the regions and then being implemented here. Which means that only 10% of the civil service works in, in Berlin at the national government and 90% works in the regions. The opposite of France. But it's a different federalism from the US where there's separate government and bureaucracy in the center and separate government and bureaucracy for the government. This is cooperative. This is why the Bundestag. Uh, is it apolitical or political? It's basically, you know, it's the same thing. It's a very professional, long tradition. Remember Prussia, uh, from which Germany was formed, uh, was one of the first bureaucratic states. Um, so there's a long tradition for of careers in the bureaucracy and specialization and so on. It's not completely political at the top, there are political uh, uh, appointments, but what's, what's different in Germany is that the positions in the top bureaucracy are divided among all parties, uh, according to proportionality. So the apparatus of the state is populated by all the parties, all of them, not just those that are in power. And that's part of the German culture that I mentioned of, uh, of German political culture, on, based on which German economy, society, politics works, which is based on we have to succeed together. And we, it's not based on who wins, who loses, although there's always you know, we, elections and winners and losers, but it's about everybody needs to be a part of it. So involve them in decision making and so on. So that's a very brief overview of, of how bureaucracies actually you know, are function in, in different states uh, that you have already uh, studied, so you, you see them a little bit in action. And what I wanted to ask you is to be able to present one of them, present one of these bureaucratic systems. Okay, the next uh, item that we need to talk about, uh, not in an extended form, is we talked about the legislature and the executive, and we focused on these two branches, but there's a third branch in any um, democratic political system, and in most states, right, in every state, the judiciary. And right, we talked about the three major functions of a modern state, right, representation, uh, executive, which is implementing laws, and then there's the judiciary, which does what? It settles conflicts. So the, rep the legislature represents the executive and represents and, and makes laws, uh, the executive implements laws while the judiciary settles conflicts. Conflicts between these institutions, conflicts in the application of the rules. So, the rules are made by those we elect to represent us in the legislature. The rules are implemented by the executive, and the rules are clarified by the, by the judiciary. Right? So the judiciary, if you read also from your book, Dan Singer's book, um, its function is that of adjudication. So the judiciary has the function of adjudication, or arbitration, or settling conflicts, right? So the adjudicative function of every political system is um, exercised by the judiciary. Uh, the role is to uh, inter interpret and apply um, rules and laws to a given situation. So it manages conflicts that ap appear in, either in the society or between institutions. The, there are different types of laws, there are different types of conflicts, right? So you will have different types of uh, law, different types of judicial action. So the major types are civil law, criminal law, and administrative slash constitutional. Civil, criminal, administrative, constitutional. We can also call it a statutory law. So the civil law deals with conflicts, uh, regulates civil law and civil courts, regulates uh, conflicts and relations between private actors. So uh, individual citizens, uh, different individual actors, firms, uh, companies, whatever it is. So non-state actors, that's the idea. So non-state actors. So there are conflicts between individual actors that are not, it's not the state. And that's very important for the civil. And these are just disputes. For example, divorce, a contract, a liability. These are disputes between civil actors, right? Unstate actors. Criminal law 
So disputes, right? I argue how much I owe you to say I owe you this much, I'm saying I owe you that much, and that's a civil conflict, right? Uh, divorce is another civil um, uh, conflict and so on. Criminal law, however, is about enforcing laws. Criminal law is not about settling conflicts, there is no conflict here, it's about breaking the law and, and a retribution, right? Retribution, correction, and so on. So it applies sanctions to behavior contrary to the social order, basically, when you break the rule, that falls under criminal law. This civil law is about conflicts, uh, disputes, disputes about different civil matters. Uh, so, right, everything falls into this, murder, substance abuse, theft, bribery, extortion, environmental pollution, when you break the law. Um, and so that's a different sort of a law, different sort of courts sometimes. And then you have administrative, constitutional, or statutory uh, law and courts. This is about the very behavior of the system itself. And this can regard, you know, the functioning of the institutions, the roles they have, the conflict between different institutions, for example, between the president and the Congress, uh, right? Between, between different institutions of the political system or within the administration, so within the bureaucracy. There can be conflicts in rulemaking, rules enforcing, are these rules just, are these rules legal, and so on, right? So, for example, within the administrative or constitutional or statutory law falls a function of courts that is very familiar, I'm sure, to you, which is judicial review. J judicial review is what? Uh, is the power of a court uh, to overturn a law based on its constitutionality. So, is the power of any court to check a law or a rule and to decide, or an action, uh, and to decide that that is constitutional or not. So power of a court to check on the actions or rules or laws passed by other institutions in the political system, right? the executive or legislature, and decide doesn't fit with the constitution. What is the constitution? It's basically the DNA, the blueprint for the entire system. We'll talk about constitutions in the next section. But the constitution is basically the fundamental law of a state and of a political system, right? the backbone, the DNA. It's the law that tells you who is what and what can they do, right? It defines the state and it defines the political system. Now, so, so since that defines the state and the political system, tells you what is the USA and what are the institutions that are legitimate in the USA, uh, all laws need to fit it because otherwise they go against the DNA. Uh, and so this is one of the possible functions of a, such a court, right? The, uh, a co such a court, an administrative constitutional court, is to uh, Censure is to, you know, uh, tell another institution in the political system that its actions are unconstitutional. Uh, there are other types of uh, law, uh, courts, for example, administrative courts, and uh, that are specifically dealing with um, uh, problems in the implementation of policy. So, for example, in, Pran in, in France, uh, <coughs> there is the highest administrative court and there's a whole system of courts that only deals with the bureaucracy. Because the bureaucracy is so widespread and powerful and centralized, your life is basically run by it to, to a good degree outside of the power of the legislature. So you need to have a system of courts that settles disputes regarding that. So again, regarding the functioning of the institutions of the uh, system. So uh, that's these are types of courts, types of you know, areas of law, rather. But the, in terms of law itself, there are two types of sources of law. Because right? law does not just fall out of the sky. So, what can be the origins of law, right? So, and how is law written and interpreted? So, there are two major types of law. There's common law and civil law. And these are two different types of, of what law, of, of uh, understandings of what laws are and how they need to be interpreted, two different sources of law. And they're, they're, they are used, these different sources, in different countries. This is why it's important to, to notice. So the common law is a, is a more Anglo, uh, from, coming from the English tradition, and this is what we have in the US, the common law tradition. Um, so there's a set of general laws and rules, usually passed by a legislature, which however evolve over time. And when there's a decision to be made in a case, right, 
these laws are interpreted according to precedent. What is precedent, right? So you have precedent. Precedent are basically previous decisions of judges or of courts in specific issues. Right? So this is the system that we have here. So when a judge is up to taking a decision and so on, then he will look uh, or she will look at previous decisions by judges. So it's a sort of an organic, a growing body of the previous decisions that basically create the legal framework. It's based on precedent. So there's a basic rule or law, but then the interpretation is based on courts, the previous court's interpretation. We have the Constitution, but how do you, how do you interpret Article 2, uh, the Second Amendment, uh, with uh, owning guns and so on? Well, courts will interpret it based on previous court's interpretation, uh, because that's, that gives meaning to the, to the law. You have the framework and then the interpretation that evolves over time. There's other things. Uh, it is uh, based on... It is adversarial, the court system, meaning that the judges, there is a neutral referee, and then you have two sides who are meant to fight it out like on a football field, right? And uh, defense and the accused, uh, the, the prosecution, and then they just fight it out, and the judge is there. Also, you have the jury system, which is typical here. Um, and, which yeah, the jury system, which is typical here. So these are basic... Um, um, traits. But why, why is this different, or what is it different from? Well, the civil law tradition. The civil law tradition is not based on precedent, but it's based on written law that is very detailed. So basically you have a code. You have a code that, that is your system of law. So when a judge gets to uh, emitting a sentence, it is not about what other judges have decided. The, the, the job of the judge is not to use his own reasoning, but to apply that written law. So every case needs to be fitted within the law. I don't care what other judges have said, although, you know, but I don't care what other judges have said. It's basically a grid within which each individual case needs to be fitted. So it's a written code of law that, that orders the entire society. It's not developed over time. It's passed, right? Well, of course, it can be changed. And within that grid, any so when some case arises, you, you have to find the right law under which it fits. And your only, judge, uh, only job as a judge is to apply. In the courts, therefore, the judges are not neutral. The judges are inquisitorial. They ask, not the inquisition, but they ask, um, they ask questions, they try to per, per, uh, pursue the truth, they, uh, they kind of, uh, uh, well, it's kind of, a, they have a sort of a prosecutorial um, um, role, uh, the judges in the civil, civil law uh, system. Uh, so it's not about two sides fighting it out, it's about the state applying the law. The state applying uh, the law, and the judge has an active role in this. Um, so, this is more English, the, the English source, uh, in, it's in UK and the US and former colonies of the UK, but this is much more widespread, the civil law tradition, because it goes back to the Roman Empire, That's, uh, the first codes of law, actually even, <coughs> even further back to the first codes of law that humankind has ever passed well, some 4,000 years ago, uh, Hammurabi's Code, for example. Uh, it has, uh, so the Roman law code, right, was basically a laying down of the rules for everyone and for everything, basically. Uh, a revival of this and another, uh, an, a, a closest source for us is Napoleon. Napoleon, again, reordered society with uh, this the famous Napoleonic, Napoleonic uh, code. And as he went around conquering in Europe, uh, he implemented that. And that was, a, that was a huge step forward because it was a uniformization and rationalization of the legal code. It didn't depend on the whims and traditions, and it's because everywhere is going to be the same. So it's sort of a greed that applies on everything. Uh, this is why it's very, very widespread in Europe, but also elsewhere. It's more widespread than the common law, which is more intricate, and it's more organic, and if you can have some weird laws from back then, and they're still in place. No, the, the civil law is like a greed that it is applied. So, obviously then, uh, you will have different... Um, these, um, 
you will have either the civil civil code, civil law tradition, or a common law tradition. That's you, you know these are two different traditions. But in terms of how the courts are organized, so structure of courts, um, they will basically the, the question will be: uh, Do you have separate systems of courts, hierarchical system of courts? Right? Because you have uh, primary courts, and then you have courts of appeal, right? And then you have a sort of a supreme court, the last appeal. Right? This is a good structure that is come encountered in many countries, right? Court and appeal, whatever. And it can be, you know, for example, in the US, it's federal and local level, you have similar structures. Last appeal, right? <clears throat> but will you have different structures, of course, different hierarchies for the different types of cases? For example, you have one for civil cases, one for criminal cases, one for administrative cases, and so on. So that's what's different in different countries, besides the fact that they can be based on a civil code or a common civil law or common law. Um, so, another question that, that is raised, so this is in terms of structure, you know, first call, uh, first court, then appeals, where you can appeal a, a judgment, and then the last appeal, right? Um, last word on the case. But uh, another issue that can be uh, raised is the position of the judiciary within the system. And that's, is it the judiciary independent from the system, or is it intertwined with the system? And, of course, you would say, well, independent, of course. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. It really depends on the, 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 the type of political system you have and of the tradition. So let's just very briefly look at the, our four countries and see how it, this works in, 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 in actuality. In the U.S., right, you will have what? Common law system. So U.S. is based on common law. I'm just going to list them. It's based on common law. Uh, you have courts because you have two systems, of, two systems of government, federal and local, federal and regional, national and regional. You will have national courts, meaning the federal system of courts, to to regulate federal laws and policies and federal cases, what falls under the federal government. And then you have regional courts, meaning state courts, who will regulate uh, laws passed by the state, by the regions. Right. In the U.S., we have one Supreme Court uh, for the federal law. Right. Uh, which is the highest court of appeal, but it's also a constitutional court. So, you see, you can appeal cases there uh, based on their constitutionality. And many people don't know that the Supreme Court also is an original court of jurisdiction, or court of original jurisdiction, meaning the lowest type of court, uh, for issues regarding, for example, diplomats. For, for diplomats, when they commit something, or that there's something involving, you know, or things that happen at, at, at sea, which is not a territory in the U.S., but still within U.S. jurisdiction, because say it's a, um, um, well anyway, it's not on the territory, uh, that in those cases the <coughs> Supreme Court is actually like any other, any other court. It's not a court of appeal, it's just a regular court. But don't worry about that. Uh, there is one Supreme Court at, at the federal level, but there are Supreme Courts at state level in the U.S., at regional levels. There are Supreme Courts in almost every state which is the highest, highest court of appeal. Uh, the Supreme Court in the US, the federal Supreme Court, has judicial review. And um, I think we, uh, just, just to give you a sense, 95% the, the of all the cases in the United States are tried in state courts. Why? Because 95% of the cases fall under state law, not federal law. So here's that idea of your life is governed by two governments in the U.S. One is federal, and one is regional, right? We call it state here, but it's not a state. <clears throat> and 95% of the conflicts are about the area of your life, your, of your life governed by the state. It gives you a sense of how you really live under two governments. The U.K. Is different, right? In the U.S., you have a separation of powers, so the, the federal judicial system is separate from the executive and from the legislature, and they have very distinct roles, and they check on each other, and so on. We talked about that. In the U.K., well, the U.K. is a parliamentary system, the opposite. You have not separation of powers, but what fusion of powers, which means that um, in the U.K., the judiciary for the longest time was. Well, what is the most powerful institution in the UK? Being a parliamentary system, well, the parliament, right? And everybody, everything else in the system, right, gets its power from the parliament, including the judiciary. So the highest court of appeal, actually, until a few years ago, 
the highest court of appeal, um, uh, House of Commons and House of Lords. The high, highest court of appeal in the UK actually used to be a part of the upper house, upper chamber of the parliament. It was a part. The members of the House of Lords were the highest court of, in the UK. Here's how you really see and feel how all the power, how this is a parliamentary system. All the power is with the parliament, which delegates it to the executive and so on and so on. So much so that even the judicial power is within the parliament. Now this has changed and there's a move now and they have established a separate Supreme Court. They moved it and kind of made it separate. So they're changing the political system without admitting it. Because this is no longer a fusion of powers, right? Because you push towards an independence of the judiciary because this kind of has become a, a criterion for democracy to have an independent judiciary. But you see, it goes against the logic of the parliamentary system. But the other thing that you need to note, although I'm not going to dwell on it now, about the, the, the Supreme Court here is that, well, does it have judicial review? Again, what is judicial review? The ability of a court to declare a law unconstitutional. Well, the UK doesn't. In the UK, the Supreme Court doesn't have judicial review for the very simple matter that the UK does not have a constitution. And we're going to talk about this when we get to the constitutions. So what is the Supreme Court? It's the highest court of appeal. Right? But remember that the UK is what? It's a unitary state, not federal, but is highly devolved. Devolved, right? Which means that Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland have their own governments to, with more or less power. Which means that they will also have their own judicial systems. Because if you have a government, you have a, an administration. If you have a government, you have policy. If you have a government, you also have a judiciary because some structures need to settle the conflicts that appear in that, under that government. If you, whenever you set up a government, you will have to set up an administration and then a system of courts to check on this, on this, on the laws produced by these, um, these governments to check, to arbitrate conflicts regarding these laws. So you will have different. Uh, what's also, you know, we talked about how how do you distribute between civil and criminal uh, law. For example, um, in France, criminal and civil law are judged by the same courts administrative law by a different set of courts. In the UK, you have criminal courts and you have civil civil law courts, meaning civil cases, right? We talked about civil cases, criminal cases, administrative cases. In France, civil and criminal together, one system of courts, administrative, another in the UK, uh, civil uh, cases uh, are one system of courts, criminal cases another system of courts. So let's talk about France very briefly. So in France, traditionally, the judiciary had little power because of the dominance of the executive. Not of the parliament in this case, but of the executive in the semi-presidential system based on the model of the goal, as we mentioned. Uh, what's, uh, so UK has what? Common law. US has what? Common law. France has what? Civil, uh, civil law tradition. Right? Common versus civil law tradition, right? Meaning that you know, Napoleon's code, as I mentioned, uh, they're based on Britain law those codes of law. Um, so, the judiciary has had traditionally little power, but it, there has been a strong move, as in most democracies, especially in the 90s, towards a more independent judiciary, so that has happened. There are several supreme courts, right, in France, because they, the different highest courts, that's what they are. Right? There is a constitutional court, there is a supreme court, and there is a, a state council. You don't have to remember this, but just understand the difference. That there's a constitutional court that only deals with exactly that, what? Judging if a law is constitutional, uh, judicial review. There's a Supreme Court, which is just the highest court of appeal. And then there's a state council, which is actually top bureaucrats who judge on administrative issues. So, bureaucratic conflicts, a specific highest a specific system of courts and a specific highest court. Uh, regular cases, civil or criminal, go to the Supreme Court. Constitutional conflicts, constitutional court. So, different uh, structures. 
constitutional council actually it doesn't uh, but understand the, the logic of it. Finally, Germany again based on codified law, so civil law tradition, just like France, Napoleon conquered Germanic states first. And also it's very important that both France and Germany have constitutions, actually, written constitutions. Germany is very detailed and very protective of individual human, uh, human rights and so on. Uh, you know, German courts in Germany, tradition of independence and so on, they do have a constitutional uh, court, in uh, federal constitutional court in Germany that is highly independent, highly prestigious, um, uh, so kind of similar to what uh, we have in the U.S., although there are differences. Why is it important? Because, you know, the legacy of Hitler and Nazi Germany, you need to have a court that is really there to enforce the Constitution. When we talk about the Constitution, I will mention again, apropos the German Constitution, uh, certain interesting facts, but um, what you need to understand is that um, it is so much at the heart of the German system. This basic law, it's called basic law, uh, not constitution, uh, that even the, their uh, FBI equivalent, you know, the, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, so basically the <coughs> service, the agency that protects the security and order of the state, is called the Office for the Protection of the Constitution. So today we briefly went through several case studies of administrative systems to see how bureaucracy works in different these four different countries to understand. I want you to be able to present one of them because I want you to be able to use the concepts we have learned to be able to explain to me how an administrative system is, uh, uh, actually functions in, in a specific one of these states. Uh, second, we talked about the judiciary and uh, judicial system, so be able to tell me about different types of areas of law, right? Civil, criminal, administrative, constitutional, um, and different traditions of law, which is common law and civil law, or co codified law, right? And these things are actually also in the Danziger, uh, this discussion of judiciary is also in your Danziger textbook. Um, and, you know, um, you need to know what a judicial review is. And finally, be able to tell me a few things about the judiciary in one of these four uh, countries, just like we did here. Now, in your textbook sections, the case studies on US, UK, France, and Germany, which we scanned and we read for the previous, in the previous section for the previous test, I also reposted them uh, in this section. Uh, keep referring to them, because they actually present to you the bureaucracy and the judiciary. There are sections on the bureaucracy and on the judiciary in those those textbook sections. Okay. Next uh, lecture, uh, we will, uh, which I, uh, we will talk uh, about political socialization. How do you form political opinions? How do you form political ideas? Uh, and also the briefly about the role. What are parties? What are political parties, and what is their role?